Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about anticipating change and managing risk in global trade this year, brought to you by the Institute of Exports and International Trade in partnership with the Bletchley Group. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Executive Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host today. And I'm delighted to be bringing you today's webinar on such an important topic. 2024 is set to be yet another year of significant change for the world with billions of people going to the polls, technological innovation and disruption continuing at pace, an increasingly changing climate, and international conflicts all taking their toll on businesses and supply chains. Today, we're going to be looking at how businesses can anticipate and mitigate these changes and their impact on trade. To begin with, though, on the next slide, it is my delight to introduce our excellent panel of speakers today. In the first part of the webinar, we're delighted to be joined by speakers from the Bletchley Group and Zurich Resilience Solutions, who will be giving an overview of the most significant likely risk factors this year and how you can engineer risk solutions. This includes Angela Irvine, the Sales Director at the Bletchley Group, who is a chartered insurance broker with 30 years experience in the sector, supporting a wide range of businesses from SMEs to multinationals. Peter D is a National Retail Broker Manager at Zurich Resilience Solutions, and an insurance business developer with 18 years experience. And Namdi Ahuchogu, a specialist risk engineer also at Zurich with over 20 years experience in various supply chain functions. We will then be joined by two further speakers for a panel discussion on the risk landscape more broadly, including the Institute's UK Public Affairs lead, Grace Thompson, who has been at the Institute for around two years, having previously worked as an advisor to MPs and at Edelman Global Advisory and Professor Trevor Williams, a former Chief Economist at Lloyds Bank, a visiting professor at the University of Derby and co-founder of FX Guard. Before we get into the presentations though, on the next slide, I'm going to run a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So we are here asking, basically, do you agree with a statement? And the statement being, I think risk around international trade will increase this year. Uh, the options hopefully broadly self-explanatory. While you're answering that poll, some quick housekeeping notes from me. Firstly, you can uh, come, contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window, which is usually to the right hand side of the screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions today, though please note we cannot guarantee we will get to every question in the allocated time. As such, I will be prioritizing questions that have relevance to the wider audience, so I won't be going into company or sector specific queries as such. Please also note that if your questions are short and clear, I am more likely to be able to read them. Finally, you will receive a recording of the webinar with a copy of the slides in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. Right, thank you everyone who's responded to the poll so far. I'll give you just a couple more seconds. Three, two, one, and let's see the results. So, most of you agree with the statement. So, most of you think Risk is actually going to be uh, more of a factor for international trade this year. 38% of you strongly agree with that statement, the same amount agree, and only 2% of you disagree with that statement. So clearly it's an environment of change and risk this year, and uh, that's really being felt by all of you on the poll. Thank you for answering. But without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Angela from the Betcher Group on the next slide to begin today's main presentation. Over to you, Angela. Thanks, Will, and good afternoon, everyone. As Will said, I'm from the Bletchley Group. We're an independent insurance broker based in Birmingham and London, and we're the par partner broker to the Institute, um, bringing various risk management solutions and insurance um, offerings to the members. Now, as the poll shows, risk is high on everyone's agenda. And at Bletchley, we can assist with various insurance um, solutions uh, to assist businesses with the challenges that they face trading internationally. Um, this includes marine cargo, trade credit, political risks, cyber liability, to name but a few. And our role as an insurance broker is to help manage and mitigate risk. So as well as working with our partner insurers in place and covers for our clients, we also offer risk management advice on a standalone basis and we work with certain partners in this field and one of them, Zurich Resilient Solutions, joined me here today. Now, 
there's quite a lot going on in the world at the moment, and um, there's plenty of us, um, plenty for us to cover rather this afternoon. So I'm going to hand over to Peter and Namdi to present on why managing risk matters more than ever in 2024. So over to you, Peter. Sorry, Peter, you're on mute. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter D. I have 35 years experience, um, partly as a chemicals engineer and then 25 years experience in insurance. Um, part of my job is making raising an awareness of ZRS or Zurich Resilient Solutions in the UK. Um, and you'll see there's a little um, link to our website where you can learn some more detail about what we do. Next slide, please. So we are a fully independent organisation uh, and available to be uh, for consultancy services across a wide range of risk management um, areas, uh, irrespective of where you place your business in terms of insurance carriers, irrespective of your trade. And we are not defined by underwriting appetites. We have a global reach. Uh, we have 800 engineers globally. We have 140 people in the UK. Um, so what I've tried to do here in this slide is to just group um, the key practices uh, where Zurich Resilient Solutions offer consultancy services. Um, so you can see for yourself a broad range and within each practice, there is a whole range of sub-services available to you. So the, the original link, there's more information available for you to refer to. So um, hopefully that gives you some context and we're working with Bletchley Group to bring you um, content relevant to your industry sector. So I will pass on now to my colleague Namdi. Thank you very much for that introduction Peter um, and I'd like to say good day to everyone on the webinar and uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, to begin the webinar um, I just want to highlight that I'll be elaborating uh, on why managing risk matters more than ever in, in 2024. Um, as a starter, um, I'll just talk a little bit about myself. Um, if we just move on to the next slide. Uh, so just a brief, brief introduction into my background. So I've worked uh, 20 plus years uh, in various industries, as, as Will mentioned at the start, uh, predominantly in a procurement and supply chain function. I've been with Zurich Resilient Solution for the last two years now as a, as a risk engineer. Uh, predominantly supporting organizations on risk and resilience topics. Uh, my area of expertise in all of this obviously being with, with supply chain. Uh, I'm also a, a chartered member of the Chartered Institute of uh, Procurement and Supply. So I provide supply chain risk management uh, so solutions uh, and resilience services to support companies. Um, those companies particularly looking to rebuild the supply chain post recent events such as Brexit, the pandemic um, and geopolitical issues, uh, just to name a few um, um, recent uh, recent events. So moving on to the next slide, uh, what's in store for for 24? Um, so we we're currently seeing a very very vast uh, risk landscape uh, with a lot of things going on in the world today. So I'm just going to touch uh, on a few of these risks that we feel are, are relevant to trade and industry. So I'll start with Red Sea disruptions. So we've seen escalating tensions in the Red Sea over the past year. Uh, the major disruptions have been to container ship flows through the Red Sea. Um, as of the 1st of February this year, the average daily transits, transits through the Suez Canal um, by bulk commodity carriers hit an all time low. Um, so it's the lowest that that passage is seen of, of container ships over the last couple of years. Um, and there was news in the media, um, I mean, just yesterday about a UK ship that was hit by rebel missiles um, and unfortunately slowly sinking in, in the Red Sea, with majority of its payload being uh, reportedly being uh, volatile fertilizer, which again, if it sinks, could have, could have a detrimental impact to, to the waterways. It's also public information that a lot of container ship uh, firms, uh, one of the firms that we work with, Maersk, um, has actually chosen to now ban um, shipments um, um, or shipments going through the Red Sea um, indefinitely um, till these, this, 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 these issues are resolved. So what's the meaning of this? This effectively pushes up the cost uh, to ship goods from east to west 
um, and miss longer transit times around the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and as we all know as consumers, in most cases, when there's higher freight costs, these costs are effectively passed on to, to goods prices. So we see the brunt uh, effect um, of these longer shipping times and uh, increased shipping costs. Um, Europe is one of the most exposed to rising costs due to uh, Euro's dependence on imports from Asia. Um, the cost of manufactured goods from clothing to furniture is expected to jump quite significantly in March. And if it, the issue persists, persists in the Red Sea, uh, rising prices uh, can be a longer run structural issue. Um, and um, it's not just being felt by, by Europe as well. Other regions um, such as the United States could also uh, begin to feel uh, a slight knock-on effect from higher freight rates between Asia um, and, and Europe spread further afield. One of the other risks that we wanted to talk about is, is the impacts of Brexit. So unfortunately, we're still seeing some, some remnant, remnants of effects from, from uh, post-Brexit. So for example, food and fresh flour imports from the EU um, um, are going to now be subject to, to Brexit custom controls. Um, adding almost 300 million pounds a year to the price of trading with the continent uh, and forcing up the price of food for British consumers. So under this new regulation, red tape, imports of chilled and frozen meat and fish, cheese and dairy products, um, and in particular, five common varieties of cut flowers um, will require uh, something called an export health certificate that's signed off by a European vet or plant inspector before they can actually enter the UK. If we move into climate change type risks, last month was the warmest January ever recorded globally. I know people that live in the UK, you, you wouldn't think that way, but in, in reality, it has been. Um, it follows the trend from 2023, um, which was the warmest year um, since records began. We're seeing hotter summers. What hotter summers have meant is that there's a need for more heat resilience measures, um, especially for those in, in, in the vulnerable category. We've seen greater flooding incidences, which has brought about increased flooding risks. Um, and this has also been prominent in the last year. From a Zurich Resilient Solutions perspective, we've seen an increase in, in our customer appetite to understand more about their exposure to climate risks and the financial impact this may have on their organizations. So a, a typical example I'll give is that we recently engaged a new client um, who advised um, that they had been told that statistically the chances of their property flooding was one in 50 years. Uh, but lo and behold, uh, they subsequently had two major flood incidences in, in the space of three years that completely halted and stopped their operations. So we worked closely with them to understand um, their additional vulnerabilities and exposures. Um, and we've now helped them put proper adaptation measures in place um, to, to support their business going forward. In addition to the climate uh, change risk landscape, there's also uh, disclosure requirements that are coming as a result of this. So some of us on the call may have heard of uh, TCFD, uh, which is the Task Force uh, uh, on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, and TNFD, which is, which is the uh, um, Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures as well. Um, and these are starting to play uh, a significant part in organizations that have to comply uh, with those disclosure requirements. Touching briefly on cyber, cyber risks um, are um, uh, also a potential issue, a potential challenge um, as well. Um, organized ha hackers uh, tend to target organizations via ransomware. Um, organizations are adapting to this and improving the way to protect, protect themselves against these attacks. But it's almost like a cat, cat and mouse game now because the, the more efficient organizations get at blocking these attacks of ransomware, the cleverer the hackers get. So there's a continual need to continue to improve resilience. Um, and then there's also, also a third party risk as well. Um, when you work with supply chains as well, that you may potentially have a cyber breach uh, that comes into your organization from a, a, a third party or supply chain perspective. Uh, touching briefly on geopolitical risks. So um, around the world in 2024, there's going to be right about around 50 different countries that will hold different um, relevant elections in, in those countries. Um, this will see an emergence of lots of different candidates with different polarized views on policies and implementation of these policies. So there is a potential risk that whatever policies are implemented, they could see a significant market shift depending on, on, on the influence of that policy as well. 
Um, and then finally, just to touch on food crisis, um, again, there was a statement by the, the, the National Farming Union last week about increases in costs, labor shortages, um, increase in flooding, climate risks affecting their supply chains, which in itself has had a knock-on effect um, um, on, on food crisis across, uh, across the world, across the globe. So there is, there is a lot going on. So if we just move on to the next slide. Um, so, from a Zurich Resilient Solutions perspective, we subscribe to the we subscribe to the Global Risk Report that's generated by the World Economic Forum. Um, and one one of the reasons why I wanted to show this slide is because of the in, it's an interconnections um, risk map um, that cuts across different categories. Um, and I think the major takeaway for individuals on this on this uh, on this webinar is that the majority of risks are interconnected. Um, and in some cases, there's a cause and effect relationship between these risks. So for example, if I take a typical example, if you look at the map, if you look at the bubble, the, the, the blue bubble, um, large bubble just at the bottom of the map that talks about economic uh, downturn, um, this could be as a consequence um, of the effects of inflation. Um, and then in turn, it could have uh, knock on effects of increased debt. Um, it could also have yeah, knock-on effects of devaluation of assets as well. So there is a, a, a high level of interconnectivity between all of these risks. And there's a high likelihood that there is no sector of the economy that will escape uh, without some sort of risk impact. And, and I think that's the reality of the risk landscape that we find ourselves in today. So I just wanted to show this slide to sort of paint that picture because I think it's a very powerful slide that shows the cause and effect relationship of the risks that uh, uh, around us today. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so I'm not going to touch on each and every one of these risks in supply chain. I wanted to delve into a little bit more about my area of expertise, uh, but I wanted to give a flavor of some of the challenges and the risks that may be apparent. So if you look at the, the um, um, items at the top, so these are the core, um, the core pillars supply chain pillars, um, which look at things like cost management, procurement, supply chain visibility, uh, capacity constraints, risk management from a supply chain perspective and sustainability within, within the supply chain. Now these pillars will all be tested in 2024 and beyond. And as a result of this test, this will lead to some of the impacts that I've highlighted in the bubbles below. So things like deterioration and damage, uh, supply utility disruptions, business impacts, etc. Um, if I were to give another example, so if we look at supply chain visibility uh, as an example, so when I say supply chain visibility, so it's about organizations knowing who their direct suppliers are, um, and at the same time, understanding who are those behind those direct suppliers, so your tier twos and your tier threes. Um, if there's an issue with having that visibility combined with a potential challenge from a capacity constraint, perspective, then you will eventually have some form of disruption in supply to your organization. So that's sort of, a, again, the, 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 the impact that's, that's going on. So we'll move on to the next slide. So let's move away from the doom and gloom. So we talked about the risks, we talked about the interconnections, the possibility of what may happen. Let's start to look at something a little bit more positive in terms of, so how can we respond to these threats? threats, how can we start to manage these, these risks? So I'm going to talk about a, little, a few um, high level steps about how uh, organizations can approach this. And I, I will also showcase uh, a handful of solutions from a, a Zurich Resilient Solutions perspective uh, that could potentially start to help the audience start to think about ways to, 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 look, uh, to look to manage these risks within the organizations. So it, from a processful perspective, I think the first thing that people want to do is identify what those vulnerabilities are know what those vulnerabilities are and they will be different for uh, similar to maybe similar organizations and similar industries but every organization is unique and will have its own vulnerabilities so first step is identifying what these are um, quantifying and benchmarking these risk exposures um, as a result of understanding the vulnerabilities um, and then prioritizing mitigation actions on the back of it so um, obviously there's going to be some actions that are very low hanging fruit that can be um, um, addressed straight away. There may be some that may, there may be a cost element to it, and there may be some that there may be a time factor to it. So prioritizing the low hanging fruit and then moving on to some of the more complex mitigation actions is always a good step. Um, using all the information you've got from your vulnerabilities and exposures to make informed decisions within the organization. And then ultimately organizations are there to make money and, and for profitability reasons. So 
um, always making those right decisions to, to support the profit, profitability of the business. And then just touching briefly on some of the things you can do if you're in logistics and transportation um, is about having a ro robust process in place to vet your suppliers, um, having an ongoing management uh, process for those suppliers in, 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 to keep them in check, you know, with per periodic checks and periodic audits to make sure that they're doing things the right way. Cross-border controls, you can improve efficiency by monitoring global events using open source of information and AI technology to bring a little bit of efficiency into it. Um, and then having mitigation in plans in place in the event of something going um, going wrong. Um, economic factors, obviously managing cost, always important to the business. Um, and then uh, one of my favorites is always researching into alternative products. So if there's a challenge with being able to supply a particular product, looking at potentially providing an alternative or a backup product is always a good way to sort of ensure that you can still continue to supply uh, or deliver services to your customers. And then obviously working with companies who have the right expertise and that can help you identify and manage these risks. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, I'm just going to showcase a little bit about what we do from a ZRS perspective, Zero Resilient Solutions. So I'll touch on the climate change risk very, very briefly. So we look at climate change risk and the climate resilient strategy as two sides of the same coin. And what we mean by that is that um, we, have an we always have an impact on the environment or we tend to have an impact on the environment and then our operations can also i'm sorry and then the what goes on in the environment can also have an impact on us so it's almost like looking at the same at, at two sides of the same coin um impact and then influence um, and what we do is that we provide risk management responses to help companies with their climate resilience uh, journey uh, from a mitigation and an ad adaptation perspective so mitigation is all about the journey to net zero um, and adaptation is about looking at the current risks, so like the flood example that I mentioned earlier, and then putting the right adaptation in place to support those organizations. And uh, obviously from a mitigation perspective, there's uh, alignment with the upcoming uh, legislation. And I forgot to mention about CSRD, um, which is a legislation is coming into effect um, in, in Europe. Um, and um, it's gonna potentially have a, a knock-on effect on how um, companies report their material risks and opportunities within within the supply chain. So there's there is a, a disclosure element within within that framework, and it's something that we can support from a zero resilience uh, solutions perspective. So moving on to the next slide, I'll touch on cyber as well. So within our cyber proposition, we we have a process called AMP. So A M P. So acronym for assessing your cyber resilience, understanding where you are. Um, uh, uh, today in terms of resilience and then building upon that. M, which is manage your cyber security posture. Again, I talked about supply chain risks. Again, we look at um, we look at potential challenges and then protect, putting those that mitigation in place, um, helping companies be able to detect and respond to any sort of cyber threats. Um, next slide. Um, and then finally, um, supply chain resilience. Again, um, we we we'll tend to look at a, a flow process for this, um, which just talks about collaboration with stakeholders, visibility, data management, risk management, continuous improvement, because processes can always um, um, benefit from improvements, um, and then crisis management. And crisis management, I think, is important because as much as hard as we try, some risks may not may always fall through the net. So always having that crisis management option is always a good um strategy to have in case some of those risks slip through the net and then you have a an opportunity to manage those risks um build a strong partnerships with your key suppliers and customers uh, and fostering open communication which will help build resilience um, and then the final slide we talk uh, um, on on solutions we talk about lots of risks um, and we also offer a, a, a digital platform, uh, ERM software. So you have, we have various risks that we're trying to manage as, uh, as organizations. We can bring all those risks into one platform, uh, which is something called Risk Clarity from a, 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 a Zurich Resilient Solutions perspective. So it's a platform where all your risks um, can be assessed, mitigated, and monitored, uh, and you can keep them all in one place rather than having various different uh, repositories for risk. Um, and then moving on to the next slide. Um, again, this is just a very holistic slide about our methodology from a Zurich Resilience Solutions perspective. Um, we have over a thousand risk engineers uh, uh, globally who have uh, various different areas of expertise in cyber, myself from supply chain perspective, business resilience, 
fire, liability, chemicals, uh, you name it. We we have a very strong methodology against uh, which which we use to quantify the risk, identify the risks, and then start to help um, clients put that uh, mitigation in place. Um, and if you just move on to the next slide, just as my colleague Pete had mentioned in the origin. No, um, as he as he first of all started, we do have a marketplace. So if you're uh, familiar with Amazon Marketplace, this is the Zero Resilient Solutions Marketplace. Very similar to Amazon. If you um, have um, any risk problems, you need a risk engineering solution. By all means, please scan on your, on your phones, and um, I think we're going to drop a link as well into the chat as well. Um, and please feel free to reach out and 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 talk to either myself or or Pete. Our email addresses are on the next slide. Um, and we'll be happy to sort of support any sort of risk uh, challenges or risk management issues you may have within your organizations. Thank you for listening. And I hope um, um, the message was, uh, was, was very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Namdi. Uh, what a great uh, uh, overview there of, of, of risk, the risk landscape, but also some of the risk solutions which are out there as well. And we'll, we'll share these slides um, in the next few days. So uh, if, if you don't get the contacts right now, then don't worry, you'll get a copy of these. In the next couple of days and i've just posted the link in the chat as, as namdi mentioned right now the next slide we are going to do a quick poll uh, this one asking you which you which of the following you think will increase the risks around international trade most this year uh, there's geopolitical or political change climate change ai and cyber threats weakening global economy or supply chain disruptions just as you answer that poll, we're gonna do a quick question from the audience. Thank you everyone. Um, thank you, Angela, Peter as well for, for uh, introducing the first part of the webinar earlier. Um, but yeah, I've got a question in here from Mark. I think I'm gonna put this to Angela. Mark asks, what insurance products can be used to protect businesses with managing risk in international trade? Angela. Sorry, epic fail, I needed to unmute myself. So no, thanks Will and thanks Mark for the question. Um, I, I kind of touched on um, at the very beginning in the intro, um, some of the areas that we get involved in that can help businesses um, in, this, in this sphere. Um, so we're sort of talking marine cargo. Um, obviously there's a lot of challenges in the Red Sea with um, cargo at the moment, um, marine cargo, cyber liability, political risk cover um, and war risks um, and trade credit is, is a big one as well at the moment with a lot of uncertainty around um, potential customers. So um, and then obviously um, the, the sort of standard suite of insurances that we deal with. Mm -hmm. So the material damage, the engineering, the, the public products and employers liability. So a whole raft of um, areas that we can assist with. Good to hear, I hope that was helpful, Mark. Thank you, Angela. Let's close the poll. This is uh, really interesting. I mean, with the caveat, I mean, as Namdi, I think said really well earlier, all of these risks are, are interconnected, of course, but over half of you say are saying geopolitical or political change is the, the most pressing risk area for trade this year. That's followed by supply chain disruption at 27%. And I think the last time we did this webinar, supply chain disruption was top. So there's a bit of a change there. The, the political environment has, has become the more kind of pressing focus. 14% of you say the weakening global economy, and it's, it's less of you saying climate change or AI and cyber at the moment. But of, of course, these are all interlinked. So I'm mean, just wondering, I mean, Nandi or, or Andrew, do you want to come in on that poll? It's a really interesting response, I think. Maybe not. Uh, Nam, do you want to pick this up? Uh, hello, yeah, sorry. I, I did the exact same thing that you did, Angela. I just struggled <laughs> to unmute myself. Um, yeah, so yes, um, it, it is, um, It is. there is the great, uh, thanks for, for picking up on that, William, uh, on, on interconnection. I think, yes, that's a very, very valid point on the interconnection. I think it's really important to understand that one thing will li link to another and there, there is the cause and effect relationship, as I mentioned in the presentation. I'm a bit surprised. Supply chain disruptions, I'm not surpri surprised about. Geopolitical, political change, yes, is quite high up there. But the one that really surprises me is the climate change piece. And I think maybe um, um, maybe there's just a maybe there needs to be a little bit more awareness because I think climate change 
based on what we've been seeing and some of the clients that we've been speaking to fairly recently is is quite prominent you know and thinking maybe about 10 years ago in my role working in a manufacturing environment i never used to take into um account um the potential disruption that my supply chain could have because uh, one of my suppliers had a flood or um there was a, a a natural disaster that prevented them supplying me components um but those issues were always happening and fast forward 10 years on it's a bit more prominent it's happening all the time you know there's there's loads of things happening and um um, I'm, I'm surprised about the climate change, the, the, the low percentage from a climate change perspective, because I think it, it, it's really important and it's going to be one of the prevalent risks going forward um, in the future. Um, geopolitical, political changes, yes, there'll, there'll be changes to policies, etc. There'll be a knock-on effect on costs, uh, which will also be a problem. But yeah, they're, they're, they're all interconnected in one way, shape or form, yeah, I think ultimately is the message. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And I mean, it'll be interesting to see how this shifts over the years, but uh, I think it's a really important point. I think sometimes people think of climate change as this big thing, which is dystopian and in, in, in the future. But actually, as you say, it's, it's you know, things like floods and stuff like that, they've, they've always happened and are, are happening at increasing rates at the moment. So um, it, it'll be interesting to see if that brings up over the next few years. But on the next slide, let's get into a bit more of a discussion around risk more broadly in, in global trade at the moment. And it's a great at this stage to welcome back uh, Grace Thompson from the Institute and Professor Trevor Williams as well, uh, who will be talking on the next question, I believe. So Trevor, we've heard about some of the factors for change for businesses just now, but could you say a bit about where the global economy is right, right now and what impacts you know, the, the overall economic picture is having on businesses that trade? noting that 14% of the last poll said the weakening global economy was their main risk area. Yes, well, I think the uh, economy and a global perspective is going to do well this year. Uh, most forecasts from IMF to uh, World Bank, uh, sister organization and the OECD have average growth this year in the world economy of around 3%. Now the long run average is, is, is a bit more than that. Um, prior to the uh, crisis that we've had, the um, pandemic and the 2008-9 uh, crisis, growth was probably growing at around about um, three and a quarter to three and a half percent. But this is going to be a strong year of recovery with uh, interest rates obviously cut, um, uh, looming, inflation off quite sharply, supply chains reopening, uh, and the um, effects of the, the war in Ukraine waning and the fall in, in, in food prices and energy prices actually happening uh, apace uh, with more to come through too, which is probably why the supply chain disruption from uh, the uh, new conflict in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East um, hasn't yet had a big effect on prices. And I don't think it will, because uh, it will only partially reverse some of the drops that were going to take place. So uh, I, I suspect it won't have a huge effect on, um, on prices generally in the world. So it's going to be a stellar year for growth. So the G20 economies, probably only one or two may see any shrinkage this year at all. Um, we may be a candidate for that, actually, uh, the UK. But the world economy is in pretty good shape. Um, but there's some big risks and some big challenges as has been pointed out by the survey, geopolitical risks. 4.2 billion people are voting this year. Many of those elections uh, won't be free and they won't be fair. Uh, so those, 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 that's the, the, the risks around that, the rising authoritarianism as well, uh, alongside some of that, uh, and challenges in, in globalization um, with some of the largest economies, uh, the US and China at loggerheads. But the US will, will grow again, uh, pretty strongly for an industrial size country. Uh, and uh, so will, will China, between four and five percent. And so will India, six six percent or so, six or seven percent, in fact. So it isn't all doom and gloom with regards to the bounce back that's taking place in, 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 uh, in global growth and, and the knock-on effects of those countries that are involved in this international trade. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. It's, it's good to have our more, um, I guess, we're due a more positive year when it comes to the global economy. It's, it's been a slightly gloomy period, but um, that's, that's good to hear. But as you mentioned, there's the, the big change highlighted in the poll was geopolitical or political risk. So Grace, if I can bring you in, let's, let's look at home first. So the UK is 
probably facing a general election this year. There's a slight chance it could be January next year, but probably not. Um, and there's definite sense that there could be a change of government. So there's polling today, uh, which you highlighted to me, actually. Savanta uh, have just had a poll saying uh, Labour is now on 44 percentage points uh, compared to Conservatives in 26, and that's a four-point uh, increase in that particular poll. What impact could you see a change in government in the UK having on trade, and how do you think this would be felt by businesses? Thanks, Will. Um, well, first of all, really interesting to see that poll before. And as Trevor said, yeah, 4.2 billion voters going to the polls this year, uh, 60 countries across the world. Um, so it's quite a momentous year. I mean, it's, it's very unusual that this kind of uh, all converges in, in one year, um, and, and especially with such major economies. But yeah, starting with, with the UK, um, I think it's important to, to just start off by saying that any fresh administration um, will it engender a time of reflection on a country's trade policy and implementation. Um, and this is you know, often due to the very close relationship between the philosophy of, of a government's trade agenda and its wider foreign policy outlook and objectives. And every government brings a new slant to that. Um, so that's something to bear in mind from the outset. Um, now, we could obviously spend time going into the ins and outs of what each party has said on trade policy going forward. But I suspect we're going to see more of that um, once party manifestos are laid out. So I'm just going to go into a, a few broad patterns to, to just give an idea of, of what could happen and uh, emphasis on the word could because it's all speculation at this point. Um, but we're seeing both Labour and the Liberal Democrats talking about moving closer to the EU in terms of trade policy. Um, we've seen that in the news even in the last couple of weeks that EU leaders are considering the 2026 review of the UK-EU trade and cooperation agreement as a time when the relationship could potentially be reset to some degree, um, if Starmer were to become Prime Minister, for example. So um, more on that later as to what that could look like, but um, that is an interesting uh, pattern emerging at the moment. I think all parties are, uh, could be said to be taking stock of the benefits and efficacy of free trade agreements. Um, so Labour have certainly said that they want to have more binding commitments for negotiators of those agreements um, to secure regional economic benefits uh, for the UK through those FTAs, um, as well as wanting to sign uh, fewer higher quality trade agreements um, um, and put the emphasis on that rather than on the number of free trade agreements that are being signed. And even at the, you know, the current Secretary of State for Business and Trade, uh, Kami Badenoch, has said that trade deals are like a motorway. Um, but without the cars of um, exports and investments going back and forth, um, you might as well have not built them in the first place. So I think the focus on all sides, uh, interestingly, is going to be on, you know, uh, focusing on, on, on signing the right trade deals going forward um, and focusing on how to help businesses utilise those best. Um, and it's interesting to see as well that there's a kind of a, a ramp up in messaging about helping small businesses to export. Um, particularly, we've seen that from um, Labour recently with their small business um, task force um, uh, and with the government with the, the, the SME council too um, uh, and there's 99% of businesses in the UK estimated to be SMEs uh, with only 9% of them estimated to be exporting so obviously there's huge potential there for uh, a new government to, to really grip that issue and to um, weave in small business support to their future strategies. Um, one interesting thing I will say is, is I heard up at the Scottish Labour Business Forum the other week that there are no plans for rejigging of government departments if Labour get into power, which I think will bring a huge sigh of relief to us all, um, particularly those in the public affairs arena. Um, uh, I think they were, they basically the, the emphasis was um, there's no point in changing things just for the sake of it. There's been so much rejigging of departments that even if it's not necessarily their kind of ideal structure for things, they want to ensure that the transition is as smooth as possible to a new government. Um, and I think finally, we just need to be realistic that a change in government isn't immediately going to impact on the day-to-day -day reality for businesses, much as we might like it to. Um, if we consider the current polling predictions, for example, that Labour are likely to win the election, um, they themselves have been very clear that change will not come overnight due to the current state of the economy. And the world we live in, um, you know, as touched on by Nandi in his presentation earlier, um, it was not going to change overnight either. Supply chains are still being threatened by you know, ongoing wars abroad. Um, however, Labour have said that they're looking to publish a trade white paper. They're going to power. Um, and I think that aim is to give businesses some confidence and clarity on industrial and foreign policy objectives and to empower businesses to explore new markets. So uh, it's, it's a bit unclear as to exactly what a new government will bring to the international trade community. But we're seeing glimmers of, of plans coming into place. 
and hopefully some kind of resilient shock proofing um, so that a transition won't be too uh, bumpy. And as you say, I mean, it's not a done deal necessarily, but it's going to be a, a Labour win. Um, so, I mean, if the Conservatives would stay in, if there's a repeat of 92, for example, you know, would that change anything for business or would it be more of the same? As it is not, a, it's not a done deal at all. I think the, the only certainty in politics is uncertainty. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll preface this answer uh, by saying, as, as you mentioned, Will, that, that the polling this morning uh, by Savanta does show Labour an 18 point lead. Um, and in fact, Labour has been consistently ahead in the poll since the start of 2022. Um, so because of that, not much in-depth analysis has really been done on what Conservatives staying in Downing Street would mean for any particular area of policy. Um, my personal take is that I think if they if they did remain in Downing Street, um, Sunak would probably look to reshuffle his top team quite quickly, um, wanting to indicate a fresh start, new approach, um, and taking into account a broad range of uh, opinions and new faces. So I think in that scenario, there'd be some rethinking on on strategies to reflect kind of a, a new a new administration within an old administration. If you can, you can put it that way. We've had a few new administrations in the old administration already, I think, but uh, that's, that's interesting to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. And just um, more broadly, as you say, and, and Trevor said, 4.3 billion people around the world are going to elections this year. So the ones which seem prominent to me are, are for the UK anyway, India, the US and the EU, uh, the European Parliament. I mean, what impact could these elections all have on, U on UK trade as well? Yeah, so the dynamic of the elections abroad affecting UK trade is largely predicated on both the political relationships and the general trade philosophies of blocks or countries, of course. So, for example, on the US campaign trail at the moment, we're seeing um, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump making statements that if he were president again, he would go further in his trade war that he initiated, initiated in his first term with the tariffs placed on aluminium and steel, for example. Um, and whilst Biden did actually keep in place Trump's um, tariffs on imports from China when he came into office, he suspended the 25% tariffs on European steel and the 10% tariffs on European aluminium. So this is one example of how, you know, a different trade philosophy between leaders can impact the rest of the um, international trade stage on which the UK operates. Um, when it comes to relationships, I think leaders and leader hopefuls around the world are kind of speculating already on who their key counterparts might be and doing some forward planning. So for example, um, the Shadow Secretary of State for Business and Trade, Johnny Reynolds visited India a few weeks ago to discuss UK-India trade talks and meet counterparts in India. And I think with the UK-India free trade agreement negotiations facing the potential of being you know, um, delayed until the next parliament, um, potential governments in waiting are kind of having to talk ahead of elections uh, about this issue, um, trying to, again, ensure that smooth transition of power that we talked about earlier. Um, a quick word on the EU. I mean, this year's European Parliament elections are incredibly important, not least because the EU as a bloc is such a significant trading partner for the UK, um, but also because the EU is the world's largest importer and exporter of goods and services. So it's an absolutely pivotal force. I think the current thinking is that there could be a political shift to the right across the European Parliament elections and somewhat of a break, therefore, with previous consensus on, on trade. Um, for example, there could be increased um, border controls, more barriers on foreign products, etc. And taking into account what I said earlier about um, Trump's likely trade war outlook, should he become president, we can well imagine a situation where the EU and the US are at loggerheads again over tariffs and other areas, with the UK somewhat in the middle. Um, so, you know, in terms of the UK's relationship to the EU beyond this, um, if reports from a number of sources are to be believed, the appetite does seem strong on the EU side for working out that resetting that I talked about earlier of the trade and cooperation agreements. Um, and this could look like, you know, taking greater advantage of opportunities for increased cooperation on UK and EU emissions trading systems or mutual recognition of qualifications for regulated professionals. Um, so that, that's an idea of, of a few kind of um, countries' interactions that, that are interplaying at the moment. Um, but of course, it's all dependent on what governments fall into place and, and at, at what um, timing they fall into place as well. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. And I mean, I guess the interesting area of this is that we've, there's a prospect of a lot of really significant changes at the political le level this year, but we have 
been through this to some extent before. I just wanted to bring Trevor in. Um, I mean, we don't have to look far too far back to kind of see you know, the Trump and Brexit uh, situations in 2016, the pandemic then in 2020, and how that impacted global economies and trade as well. I mean, to what extent from looking back over the last few years, what can we say about the potential impact of any shocks or changes in this year uh, in the global economy? Well, I think it's uh, there were quite large the risks, which is why uh, international trade and um, geopolitical risks are so high on the agenda. With political risks amplifying that, as Grace has quite rightly pointed out. So I think that uh, if Trump were to win, for example, um, and the elections coincidentally might even occur on the same month as the UK one, uh, which I think will be a first. Um, so. Again, if uh, he reimposed higher tariffs on China, for example, then that would be a big shock to the world economy. If China uh, invaded Taiwan, I mean, we would have uh, a 20, 2008 event. Um, I mean, the Chinese are responsible or the Chinese economy is responsible for producing around uh, just under a third of all global manufacturing goods. So any hot war between them and the US would be an absolute disaster for all of us. Um, but that's an unlikely scenario, but it's still a high enough risk for businesses to want to take into account. So um, there's some serious downsides. On the other hand, uh, the upsides, as I mentioned earlier, are still quite good, uh, which is to say that uh, we are going to see the best year for growth since the bounce back from the pandemic. But if we want to look before that and take that period out, then I think it's going to be in line with almost the long run average, which says a lot uh, about the potential for global growth, even in an environment where we have climate risk, uh, fast pace of technological change, the, the defining force that's changing so much of our underlying relationships is the demographic shifts, which, which plays into labor shortages and high levels of immigration and the, the opposition to that in countries that a challenge societally in, in a variety of political and, and other ways. So I think we're in a period of flux, but the underlying picture is still one where the, the mechanics of the global economy still operate. Just following up on that, there's a question that's come in from, from Peter, actually, and it's I think it's a really good one. And it's around, I mean, we hear a lot about, you know, new trading blocks emerging and kind of this kind of Global, the global order of trade changing to something more kind of block or regional based. I mean, do you see that potential shift from a more globalized system to a more kind of localized approach? I think we've seen a, the more localized approach <laughs> for many years, actually. You know, we'll, we remember that the uh, General Agreement on Tariffs of Trade uh, was never, the, the third one was never concluded. Um, and and, 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 and in, in part, by the way, one of the reasons why we had so much global challenge was because that trade agreement was never done, um, the Doha one, never concluded. It's a big disappointment in the sense that it would have entrenched the rules of international trade. It would have benefited many of the developing economies. It would have opened up agriculture. It would have opened up the services sectors and would have seen much faster growth and, in my view, greater prosperity. More trade is better than less trade, inescapable fact of history. Um, and so the uh, regional agreements are good, but they will they will never be as good as a general agreement, which opens up markets far more to everybody. So it is good that regional agreements are taking place, but these tend to reflect some of the somewhat power balance. Uh, the larger economies will do want to do uh, trade agreements with smaller countries because they can get more of what they think they need um, uh, from them. So this fragmentation is not is not good. General agreements are better than smaller agreements and regional agreements, but uh, those agreements are better than nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. I mean, it's, it's an interesting time anyway, because obviously we, we're doing this webinar as WTO, the ministerial conference has taken place. And there's some really big negotiations going on there around fisheries and agriculture and the e-commerce moratorium as well. But you can read on uh, our website about some of the negotiation points there really interesting area there. So thank you. Thank you to the panel so far. Remind everyone you can ask questions using the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, but just before we do some more questions on the next slide, I uh, just want to do a quick reminder that, um, you know, during periods of change, organisations like the Institute are here to support businesses 
help you to manage this option and to trade effectively. Membership of the Institute gives you access to a wide range of benefits that help your business to succeed overseas, including exclusive in-depth and practical webinars, guides and insights on trade trends and regulatory changes, access to our team of trading customs experts via technical helpline, as well as networking opportunities with fellow traders and trade professionals. I'll post some of the details from this slide in the chat shortly, but you can also opt in via the next poll if you want to receive a bit more information about how we can support your business. And that includes, you know, uh, some of the membership offerings mentioned by Angela earlier around kind of insurance and, and the Betsy group. So do, do uh, let us know if you'd like to receive more information. But just as you answer that poll, we are getting some good questions coming through from the audience. So let's start with this one from Sally, uh, who says, it's talking about AI actually. So I think you mentioned AI and cyber in your presentation, Andy. Sally asks, does AI present opportunity for traders as well as risk, particularly around streamlining the manual inputs of things like customs or supply chain data? Nandi, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, William. Thank you for that question, Sally. So um, I think um, it's a bit of a complex one, but I think initially, I think my, my thoughts are, the, the answer will be yes. So AI does present opportunities, you know, for traders by streamlining manual inputs, you know, of custom or supply chain data. Um, it brings efficiency and speed of operations. Um, AI can also automate uh, routine tasks like data entry, document processing, um, compliance checks, um, reducing errors and saving time in the process. Um, so by using AI for these sort of processes, um, traders can improve you know, especially within supply chain, it can improve inventory management, they can optimize logistics, uh, mitigate risks um, with, you know, risks associated with disruptions or delays. Um, but one thing I will say, one thing I will caveat is that there is also, there are also risks associated with AI in trading um, and, and supply chain management as well. Um, so the most well-known one obviously is, is around data security. Uh, so AI systems rely heavily on data, um, which uh, which uh, raises concerns um, about data privacy, security breaches, and potential uh, misuse of sensitive information. Um, and then there is a there is a high dependency on the technology as well, because I always say you can use AI, but always still have that human touch as well um, in, in 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 collaboration with it, because sometimes there's an over reliance on AI systems. Um, and if there isn't any human oversight, it can lead to errors, biases, um, which will then impact the decision-making process. Um, and then there's also a shroud around re regulatory compliance, um, around uh, the implementation of AI um, as well, and just ensuring that uh, any regulations and standards um, are in place, there's transparency and there's fairness. Um, um, with the use of AI, um, as well as the outstanding issue around around um, ethical ethical use as well, um, we do have in, internally um, you know, from a resilient solutions perspective, we do have an AI cyber risk e expert. Um, again, if anybody has these, this sort of challenge or has any questions, uh, there, we do have a, a lot of thought leadership around demystifying AI as well. Um, that can support uh, support uh, any members of the institute or or anybody that has has a, a keen interest out there as well. Hopefully, that answered the question in a in a roundabout way. I, I think so. there's a lot of info there. Thank you, Nandi. That was, that was terrific. Um, we'll just move the slide actually forwards. One just to bring back the panel. I think there you go. Very nice. Right. Uh, you mentioned climate earlier, Nandi. It's obviously a really big area. Um, Raj has asked this question actually around kind of supply chain monitoring. So I guess it kind of follows from the last question. And it's how do you ensure your supply chain partners are providing you with accurate in data or information when it comes to things like supply chain emissions, particularly for things like ESG monitoring? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And uh, it's often asked as well. Um, and I'll give an example again of what we do, what we do in Zurich. So we, one of the things we do is we partner with a, um, a, a company that has expertise in in this particular space, especially in the space of uh, carbon carbon emissions monitoring, um, a, a supplier scope three emissions monitoring, um, and we offer that solution to our suppliers um, to help them monitor their uh, carbon emissions, um, which in turn 
um, um, helps us calculate our scope three emissions. Even though as an organization, we're not we're not obliged to report that at this stage, uh, but we know in the future that that may come. So I think partnering with 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 organizations that have the expertise and uh, to be able to supply that data and providing some sort of incentive to your supplier partners, your business partners, um, that allows them to take up that te technology or that um, expertise from these companies. Um, I've always been a big advocate of, of transparent communication as well. So fostering open communication channels with your suppliers, with your business partners, um, and clearly communicate the importance uh, of the accuracy of the data that you're asking for, especially from an ESG monitoring uh, perspective. Um, and then there's also a little bit of awareness and training as well, because not everybody kind of understands the full landscape of what ESG means and what it means to their organization. So I think there's a, there's a little bit of help and training and support that can be given um, to, to suppliers and supply partners um, in terms of them understanding the, the, the impacts of ESG monitoring. Um, and I think yes, I think that's uh, that's it in a, in a in a nutshell. And I think I'm can always a big advocate of continuous monitoring as well. So can I just chip yeah. in there, Andy, as well? Just um, sure. I've, I've seen I've seen our climate team helping customers with uh, establishing their current reporting, uh, the current data, uh, the continuous reporting side of ESG also applying that framework down the supply chain to their supply chain partners. Um, it's quite an extensive piece of work, but it's quite revealing in the same time. Um, people always assume it's always about the climate. It's also about the social and the governance side of it. So there's a lot of interest around it, particularly with regards to CSRD, which is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is probably due, it, it, it's estimated to due to hit in the first quarter of 2025. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. If, Andy. Yeah, just to find out to that, you know, to what Peter said, absolutely. You know, we do we do provide workshops if people are because a lot of people are, don't know how to start or don't know what the first steps are to take in terms of ESG monitoring and reporting and the accuracy of it. So we do provide workshops. Uh, like I said, there's a, there's a multitude of people with uh, a lot of expertise within the organization that can that can support, even if it's just an, a no obligation conversation chat. Um, we can we can we can sort of help organizations and steer them in the right direction of where they need to go. Thanks, thanks guys, thanks both. Um, just say quickly, we had a question in from uh, Harminder, I hope I said that correctly. Uh, things for you, Grace. So it's just building on the discussion of green um, and climate uh, aspects, and they've asked, to what extent do you think this will be a big inf uh, influential factor in some of the elections coming up this year? Interesting question, yes. Um, I think it'll be very interesting to see what's in party manifestos in relation to um, climate and, and green policy uh, in particular. Um, obviously, we had Labour sort of rowing back slightly a couple of weeks ago on the 28 billion uh, green investment plan. Uh, some of you may have seen that. Um, and I think some of the rationale behind that was, was essentially talking about how they can't be as ambitious as they would like to be because of the state that the economy's in at the moment. So I, I would say, particularly with, with Labour, um, they probably would like to go further uh, on, on climate issues, but might be hampered economically slightly. Um, and I, I think related to that, it'd be very interesting to see what policy areas change in relation to free trade agreements. So I think um, certainly uh, Labour and Lib Dems have been talking about getting different provisions in free trade agreements in relation to environmental and social governance factors, climate change and that kind of thing. So um, I think it's a, a case of watch this space, but equally, um, it, things would probably look different if the world's economic outlook also looks different, would be my short answer to that. Well, hopefully there's there's not too much disruption to some of the growth, which uh, Trevor was mentioning earlier, so hopefully there's, there's a better picture coming along there. At this point, very Thanks, folks. We're going to have to start wrapping up. So I'd like to say thank you again to today's speakers in Angela from the Betsy Group, Nandi and Peter from Zero so, Resilience Solutions, Professor Trevor from FX Guard, and Grace from the Institute. A lot of information there, but I hope we've been able to give a decent overview of the challenges which could be faced by businesses trading internationally uh, this year, particularly around understanding and managing the risks that are clearly out there. 
Before we go, on the next slide, just a quick reminder of some upcoming webinars and events. Our next free webinar is on International Women's Day next Friday. This is going to be an inspiring session on breaking down barriers for female entrepreneurs in trade. Definitely sign up to that. I think that's going to be a really, really important event. But also some extremely useful lunchtime learning sessions coming up throughout March for members of the Institute. These go into practical details on key topics such as CBAM, ESG, CDS, customs authorizations, and exports controls. We've also got our first in-person regional event this year in Bristol on 11th of April, a great chance for traders and trade professionals in the Southwest to connect and share best practice. For more information on all of these exciting events, please go to uh, the link, which is on the slide. It's also in the chat. It is export.org.uk forward slash events. Finally, a reminder, we will be sending the slides and recording of today's webinar in a follow-up email, which you should get over the next day or so. Please do get in touch if for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. But thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. As you leave, please do let us know what you thought of today's session and any suggestions for future, future topics and future events by completing the short exit survey. But for now, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.